Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys. Section 25. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys, A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites, by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 10. Primero to Predazzo, Part 2. The view from the bridge at evening, looking over toward Castel Pietra and the mountains at the head of the Primero Valley, is singularly wild and beautiful. The Sima Simeda, bristling all over with peaks and pinnacles like a porcupine, the Sas Mayor, a mighty double-headed monster, compared by Mr. Leslie Stephen to the upraised finger and thumb of a gigantic hand, the Sima di Bal, so called after the dauntless author of the Alpine Guide, and a long array of other summits, many of which are nameless to this day, here climb against the sky in strangest outline, and take the last glow of the western sun. I name them from here after knowledge, but so many and so bewildering are these Primero Dolomites, that it is not till one has been a day or two in the place, and has seen them again and again from various points of view, that one comes to identify them with anything like certainty. The Sas Mayor, a corruption of Sasso Maggiore, or Great Rock, must, however, be accepted from this general assertion. It is a mountain which, once seen, can never be mistaken for any other, but which at the same time is only to be viewed under its most extraordinary aspect, from either the Val Privatale or the Val di Canali, two diverging forks of the great upper valley behind the Castle Pietra. We devoted the Monday following our arrival to the Val di Canali, which is undoubtedly the great site of Primero. The way thither lies through Tonadigo, along the road by which we came down that weary Saturday evening, and up the stony steep crowned by Castel Pietra. Once at the top, we bear away almost due north, leaving to the right the path leading to the Cerita Pass, and striking up behind the castle along the left bank of a rapid torrent, rushing down toward the valley. Having followed this track for about three-quarters of an hour, we emerge upon an open space of grassy lawn about a mile in breadth, by perhaps a mile and a half in length, at the upper end of which stands a modest white house, surrounded by sheds and farm buildings. This little summer residence has been built of late years by Count Velsberg, who also owns a palazzo in Primero, and whose ancestors, once seigneurs of all the valley, with power of life and death over their vassals, erected yonder castle which, perched on its inaccessible rock like St. Simeon Stelates on his solitary pillar, yet keeps watch and ward at the mouth of the valley. Dark fir slopes enclose this pleasant prairie round about. The torrent brawls unseen in a bushy hollow to the left. Cows and goats browse here and there on the green turf, while the whole pastoral scene is set, as it were, in a cirque of dolomite peaks of the first magnitude a cirque with which the Karam Malkora, grand as it is, will not bear a moment's comparison. For the mountains surrounding the Valbuona lie out in a wide amphitheatre, but here the shattered walls of Dolomite, all grey and sulphur-streaked, and touched with rusty red, close in upon the valley in two long, serried ranks, not more than a mile and a half apart at their widest point, and narrowing till they meet in the form of an acute angle at the head of the glen. Here, where the sward is smooth, and the space yet broad between, two converging lines of peaks are already arrayed before our eyes, one extending nearly due east and west, the other running up from the southeast to meet it. The first is far the grandest, beginning with the Sima Simeta, from behind which the Sas Mayor shoots out its extraordinary impending thumb, more of the perpendicular than the leaning tower of Pisa, the chain leads on in one unbroken sweep, giving first a more distant glimpse of the Palle di San Martino, coming next upon the magnificent Cima de Fradusta, next after that upon two nameless lower peaks, broken up into sheafs of splintered arrowheads, lastly upon the Cima de Canali, apparently loftiest of all the range as seen from this point. No glaciers find a resting place among these perpendicular precipices only a narrow ledge outlined in white, or a tiny intermediate plateau sheeted with dazzling snow, serves here and there to mark the line of eternal frost. Two small but very curious features in the scene deserve mention. These are two circular holes, 
one just piercing the top of a solitary sabre-blade splinter jutting out from a buttress of the anonymous peak next before the Cima de Canale on the left of the valley, and another precisely similar peep-pole, piercing a precisely similar sabre-blade, jutting out from a spur of the Sasso Ortiga on the right of the valley, precisely opposite. What may be the actual diameter of these strange holes I am unable to guess, but they look as clean-cut and about as large as the shot-hole made by a large cannon-ball. Anyone who has ever visited the Valley of Grindelwald will remember a similar orifice, locally known as Martin's Lock, in the crest of the Eiger. Waiting here only long enough to get the accompanying outline of the range as seen from Count Velsberg's meadow, we again push on, for clouds are already beginning to gather about the summit of the Cima di Canale, and we are still far from the head of the valley. Hence the path lies for a long way in the shade of the fir-woods, then by the side of the torrent-bed, here very wide, and bordered by a broad tract of glaring white stones, then through more woods, with openings here and there, through which the great mountains are seen to be ever closing in, nearer and loftier. For the farther one penetrates up this wonderful glen, the more overwhelming is the effect, till the whole culminates, at last, in a scene of savage grandeur unsurpassed, if I may venture to say so, by even the great impasse at Macagnana. By the time we reach this ultimate point, however, the rapid mists have already gathered in a way which, though it enhances the mystery and sublimity of the view, is yet sufficiently disappointing at the end of more than three hours' journey. The Sasso di Campo, which we are destined never to see clearly, is so shrouded in dense vapors that only the lower flanks of it are seen reaching up into the gloom. The huge Cima di Canale, visible less than an hour ago, towers overhead, already half lost in a heavy gray cloud. A long serrated line of stony coal uniting these two great masses shows all striated and ribbed by the action of prehistoric glaciers. Green pastures, and above these dark fir woods, climb to about one-third of the height of the Cima de Canale, while innumerable threads of white waterfall are seen leaping from ledge to ledge and wavering down the cliffs in every direction. These waters, gathered into three roaring torrents, hence rush down from three different points, and unite somewhat lower in one broad impetuous stream. The sound of them fills the air like the roaring of the sea upon an iron-bound coast. The fir-trees shiver, as if a storm were at hand. I doubt if a more lonely, desolate, and tremendous scene is to be found this side of the Andes. So many interesting excursions may be made from Primero that the traveller who has only two or three days to dispose of cannot hope to achieve even the half of them. The place, indeed, is one to be chosen for a lengthened sojourn, and treated as headquarters till the neighbourhood is exhausted. We regretted at the time that it was not in our power to do so. The ascent of Monte Pavione, an uncommon-looking mountain in a shape like a stunted pyramid, lying away to the southwest of Primero, and forming the highest point of the range known as the Vette di Feltre, is said not to be difficult. The view from the summit commands the whole sweep of the Adriatic coast, from the mouth of the Isonza, at the head of the Gulf of Trieste on the one side, to Chioggia, twenty miles south of Venice on the other. Many rarest plants are also to be found on the mountain, amongst which the following are enumerated by Ball. Anemone baldensis, anemone narcissiflora, Renanculus segueri, and Renanculus thora, Delphinium montatum, Papaver perensianum, Erebus pumilla, Elysium wolfinianum, Cochlearia brevicalis, Alcini lanceolata, Alcini graminifolia, Cerastium tomentosum, Faca Frigida, Potentilla nitata, Saxifraga petri, Valeriana elongata, Tarmica oxyloba, Scorzonera purpurea, Pederota ageria, Pederota bonarota, Pedicularis rosea, Primula facini, Cortusa mathioli, Avina hosti, and Asplenium silosi. 
This excursion involves a night and a haybed in a chalet on the Anurola Alp at the foot of the Pavillon rocks, but this is a difficulty that would not have deterred us had we been traveling in a larger party. The ascent of Monte Erzon, a mountain rising about 8,700 feet, and situated in a fine central position about three miles northwest of Primero, is also strongly recommended by the local guides. A very interesting excursion, however, and one which can be accomplished all the way on mules, is to the Ponte della Chios on the Monte Verderne, a small wooded mountain bordering the west bank of the Sismone, about three miles below Primero. The way thither lies along the main road as far as the villages of Mizano and Emer, thence over the Sismone Bridge, and up a rough carreta track, all black underfoot from charcoal droppings, which skirts the pine slopes overhanging the gorge of the Nona. The path rises and winds continuously. The Primero Valley is left behind and soon lost to sight. The torrent down below becomes inaudible. We meet a train of mules laden with huge black sacks of charcoal, and have to back up against the rock to let them pass. They, however, according to the nature of mules, prefer the brink of the precipice, and pick their way past with half their bulky burdens overhanging the abyss. At length, when we have mounted to a height of perhaps fifteen hundred feet above the valley, we pass under an impending roof of rock, and find ourselves at the mouth of a gigantic cavern, which looks as if it might have been scooped out by some mighty water-power ages ago, when the world was as yet unfinished. Beyond this cavern there rises a semicircular wall of vertical precipice, at the end of which a small cascade leaps out over the ledge, and is dispersed in mist before it reaches the brown pool below. Our path turns abruptly into and round the inside of the cavern, then along a giddy wooden shelf supported on pine trunks driven into the face of the rock wall opposite. This is the Ponte de los Chios. The shelf looks horribly unsafe, but is extremely picturesque, and the whole scene, though on a grander scale, reminds one of the cavern and wooden gallery at Tivoli. A little carved and painted Christ under a penthouse roof is fixed against the rock, just at the beginning of the bridge, and an old white-haired man coming down that way pulls off his hat and stays to mutter an ave as we pass. From this point a short ascent of about another thousand feet would bring us out, we are told, upon the Anura Alp, but we dare to go no farther, for the sun is already near setting, and we fear to be overtaken by the dusk. Still, it is none the less tantalizing to find that we have made nearly one-third of the ascent to Monte Pivione without knowing it. Leaving Primero for Predazzo, but stay, how can I leave Primero without one word of Signor Prospero? Signor Prospero, genial, fussy, courteous, enthusiastic, indefatigable, voluble Signor Prospero, whose glory it is to be a member of the Italian Club Alpino, who believes the British nation to be the most enlightened that the sun shines upon, who so worships the very names of Ball and Leslie Stevens, that he all but takes off his hat when he mentions them, as if they were his patron saints, who vaguely imagines that every English tourist must be in some way or other illustrious, that all our autographs are worth having, and that the universal family of Smith represents the flower of the human race. End of section 25「Trodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys」Section 26 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards Chapter 10 Primero to Prodanzo Part 3 Shall I ever forget that blazing afternoon when, gaitered, white-hatted, his garments buttoned all awry, and a striped silk umbrella under his arm, he escorted me to Signor Sartori's museum and apiary, or that evening when he came to call, and we entertained him on the landing, and he talked for two hours without stopping, about state education, the Darwin theory, the calculating machine, capital punishment, prehistoric man, the Atlantic cable, universal suffrage, positivism, the solar spectrum, the Alabama claims, the sources of the Nile, the Prussian military system, 
the liberty of the press, the Armstrong gun, the Suez Canal, the eruption of Vesuvius, and the rights of women. A kindly, benevolent, public-spirited old man, eager to promote something like culture and progress in his native town, and interested in all that stirs the great outer world beyond his ken. To establish a more rapid system of postal communication, to get the wire brought over from Feltra, to improve the teaching in the Primero schools, and to found a local newspaper, these are among the dreams that he is striving to realize. The little Teatro Social, for Primero has its tiny amateur theatre and corps dramatique, is of his creation and under his management. The new road to Perdazzo would not have been put in hand, probably, for the next ten years, but for the energy with which he was continually agitating the question in Primero. Ecco, signore, he said, unconsciously quoting the dying words of Gotha, what we want in our little valley is more light. Our people are not poor, but they dwell in the darkness of ignorance. We have schools for the children, it is true, but then what is to be done with their parents who regard geography as an invention of, con rispetta, the devil? I think it was the same evening, when all the lamps were out in the little world of Primero had well nigh dropped into its first down sleep, that we heard a delicious tenor, rich and sweet and powerful, ring out suddenly through the silence of the night. It began a little distance off, died away, came back again, then ceased close under our windows. The air was Verdi's, hackneyed and commonplace enough, but the voice was fresh and faultless, and belonged, as we learned next day, to young Bonetti, the second son of our landlady. He told us that his name was already entered on the books of the Conservatoire of Milan, and that he was to begin his vocal studies in November. It is said that so fine a voice has not been heard within the walls of the academy for more than a quarter of a century. With regard to Signor Sartoris, just named, he seems to have raised apiculture to the dignity of a science. Self-taught, he has discovered how to regulate the productiveness of the race, and is said to be able, unhurt and unstung, to take in his hand and transfer from hive to hive the queen bee and her court. How far this may be true, I cannot say, but I saw his museum and his apiary, the former a collection of all the bees, beetles, butterflies, woods, minerals, and chemical products of the district, the other a ghetto of hives, one hundred and fifty in number, containing a population of several millions of bees, the whole packed into a tiny back garden less than an eighth of an acre in extent. His father and sisters show these things with pardonable pride, but Signor Sartoris no longer lives in Primero. Though not yet thirty years of age, he has been appointed director of a government apiary at Milan, and is there developing his system with extraordinary success. And now we must say farewell to Primero and all its notabilities. We must say farewell and be going again, for there are yet many places to be seen and many miles to be traversed, and the pleasantest tours and the brightest summers cannot last for ever. So away we ride again one bright early morning, overwhelmed with good wishes and kind offices, presented by Signora Bonetti with a parting testimonial in the form of a big cake, so big that it can hardly be got into the basket. Our way lies by the new military road as far as it is yet completed, and along the Val Sismone, that great valley which descends from the northwest, running parallel with the Val Privitale, and divided from it by the range that ends with the Sima Simeta. Following almost the same course at first as the old road, and crossing the stream near Siror, where may yet be seen the entrance to the ancient silver mine, the new strata then strikes up in a series of bold zigzags, and is carried at a great height along the precipitous slopes bordering the west bank of the torrent. Up here all is silent, all is solitary. A couple of Austrian gendarmes, a little group of cantonniers at work upon the road, a tiny donkey staggering under a gigantic load of hay, these are all the living things we meet for hours. But the great mountains on the opposite side of the valley keep us solemn company during many a mile, a wonderful chain of dolomite peaks, less incredible in outline, perhaps, than those of the Val de Canali, but rising to a more uniformly lofty elevation. One by one we pass them in review. First comes the Sima Simeta, called by Mr. Gilbert the Procession Mountain, but to my thinking more like some strange petrified sea-monster 
bristling all over with gigantic feelers. Next come the mighty leading towers of the Sas Mayor, then the Sima Simerla, so called from the Simerla woods below, the Sima Privatale, and the Sima di Bal, three names as yet not entered in the maps. Lastly, the vast perpendicular wall of the Pala di San Martino, which rises grander and steeper with every foot of the road, and seems to fill the scene. At length, however, we turn away from this great panorama, through a pine wood and across a green, undulating alp, all ablaze with gorgeous golden lilies, and so arrive at the tiny church and rambling hospice of San Martino. Arriving here, after four hours of easy riding, we pause to take half an hour's rest before attacking the Costonzella Pass. It is a large, dirty, ruinous place, once a monastery, then a feudal residence, now an inn and farmhouse combined. It was built somewhere about the middle of the eleventh century, while Edward the Confessor was yet reigning here in England, and when the bishops of Trent were lords of Primero. It was these spiritual rulers who erected the church, the monastery, and the hospice, and dedicated them to San Martino. Having ordered coffee, we are shown up into a big upper room at the end of a wilderness of passages. It has been a grand room once upon a time, perhaps the prior's own snuggery, perhaps a guest chamber for travellers of distinction. The walls and ceilings are all oak, panelled in sunken squares ornamented with bosses and richly carved. A carved shield charged with the Velsberg arms in faded gold and colours commemorate the time when the building had ceased to be a monastery and become a baronial residence. Old family portraits of dead and gone Velsbergs hang all awry upon the walls and stand piled in corners, draped in cobwebs and loaded with the dust of years. Courtiers in flowing wigs, prelates in lace, doughty commanders in shining cuirasses. A certain Princess Canonicus in a religious dress, with long white hands that Van Dyck might almost have painted, must have been pretty in her day, if the old limner did not flatter her. These bygone lords and ladies, together with a curious old porcelain stove in blue and white delft, two squalid beds, a deal table, and four straw-bottomed chairs, are all the furniture the room contains. It ought to be a haunted chamber, and is the very place in which to lay the scene of a ghost story. The whole house, indeed, has a fine, murderous look about it, and is as solitary, forlorn, and medieval a place as any sensation novelist could desire for a mise en scene. The good road ends at San Martino, that is to say, it extends in an unfinished, impassable state for another two or three miles, but we strike straight up the col by a wild glen and over a grassy slope thick with crimson alp roses, till all at once we find ourselves on the summit of the pass, standing just below the base of the Simnon della Pala. The air up here is cold and rare. The pass rises to a height of 6,657 feet. The stupendous dolomite wall over our heads towers up to 11,000 feet, of which more than 3,000 feet are sheer, overhanging precipice. In form it is like a gigantic headstone with a pyramidical coping stone on the top. Terrific vertical fissures, which look as if ready to gape and fall apart at any moment, give a frightful appearance of insecurity to the whole mass. Not the Matterhorn itself, for all his cruel look and tragic story, impresses one with such a sense of danger, and a feeling of one's own smallness and helplessness, as the Simon de la Pala. Looking back from this elevation in the direction of Primero, we get a wonderful view of the Pala de San Martino, the Sas Mayor, and the summits of the Val de Canali. Beyond these the Pavillon and the Vete de Feltre, and beyond these again a vast troubled sea of pale blue and violet peaks, some of which encompass the lake of Garda, and some watch over the towers of Verona. And now the clouds, which for the last hour or two have been gathering at our heels, begin driving up the pass and scudding across the face of the great Dolomite. Soon all the lower summits are obscured, the vapors roll up in an angry masses, and the huge peaks now vanish, now look out fitfully in gloom and storm-cloud. Passing an unfinished building, presumably a new hospice, on the top of the pass, we emerge upon the Constanzella Alp. Here an entirely new panorama is unfolded before our eyes. 
the great prairie undulates away to a vast distance underfoot. To the north opens another sea of peaks terminating with the summits beyond Innsbruck. To the east lie wooded hills and rich pasturages. To the west a steep descent of apparently interminable pine forests bounded by a new range of dark, low, purple peaks streaked here and there with snow. The loftiest and nearest of these is the Monte Calbricon. It needs no geological knowledge to see at once that these new mountains are not dolomite or that we are, in fact, entering upon the first outlying forfiris of Predasso. The path now turns abruptly to the left and plunges down through the steep pine forest. Somewhere among those green abysses, halfway between here and Predasso, lies the hospice of Paneveggio, where we are to dine and take our midday rest. On the verge of the dip we dismount, promising ourselves to walk so far and leaving the men and mules to follow. It is a grand forest. The primeval pines up here are of gigantic size, rising from eighty to over a hundred feet, enormous in girth, and garlanded with hoary gray-green moss, the growth of centuries. Except only on the pines close under the summit of the Vengern Alps on the Grindelwald side, I have never seen any so ancient and so majestic. As we descend they become smaller, and after the first five or six hundred feet dwindle to the average size. A fairly good path, cool and shady, carried down for a distance of more than fifteen hundred feet in a series of bold zigzags, and commanding here and there grand sweeping views of forest slope and valley, brings us at the end of two hours rapid walking to an open space of green pasture, in the midst of which are clustered a wee church, a pretty white hostelry, and a group of picturesque farm buildings. Steep hillsides of pine woods enclose this little nest on every side. There is a pleasant sound of running water, and a tinkling of cowbells on the air. The haymakers on the grassy slope behind the house are singing at their work, singing what sounds like an old German chorale in four parts. It is a delicious place, so peaceful, so pastoral, so clean, that we are almost tempted to change our plans, and stay here altogether till tomorrow. By and by, however, when the two hours have expired and the mules are brought round, we go on again, though regretfully. At this point we enter the Val Travignolo, here only a deep torrent gorge between steep woods, but broadening out by and by into cornfields and pasture meadows rich in all kinds of wild lilies, orange and silver white, and pinky turkscaps speckled with dull crimson. Thus always descending and overtaken every now and then by light showers followed by bursts of fleeting sunshine, we arrive, at the end of nearly three more hours, inside of Predazzo a widely scattered village in a green basin at the end of the valley. It looks like a prosperous place. The houses are large and substantial, with jutting Tyrolean eaves. Two church spires rise high above the clustered roofs. Farm buildings and Swiss-looking brown chalets are scattered over the green slopes that circle round the town, and, as we draw nearer, we find ourselves traversing an extensive suburb of sawmills and timber yards, which here skirt both banks of the torrent. And now, following at the tail of a long procession of grave, cream-colored cows, all shod like horses with iron shoes, and carrying enormous bells about their necks, we make our entry into the town. The children run out into the road and shout at our approach. The elder folks come to their house doors and stare in silence. The Austrian gendarme at the door of the guardhouse lifts two fingers to the side of his cap in military fashion as we pass. Then emerging upon an open space of scattered houses surrounding the two churches, we find ourselves at the door of a large, old-fashioned, many-windowed inn, the very counterpart of the ancient stern at Innsbruck, over the arched entrance to which swings a gilded ship, the sign of the Nave d'Oro. End of section 26「Unfrequented Valleys」section 27. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys – A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 11. The Fassa Thal and the Fadaha Pass. Part 1. The most unscientific observer sees at first glance that the lakes of Albano and Nimi 
occupy the craters of extinct volcanoes. The craters are there, cup-like, distinct, and tell their own story. You must climb a mountainside to get to the level of them. You stand on the rim of one, you look down into it, you may walk all round it or descend to the water level at the bottom. Nothing can be clearer or more satisfactory. But it is startling to be told that Perdazzo occupies just such an extinct crater, and that the mountains which hem it in on all sides, the Monte Mulat, the Monte Vicina, the Weishorn, and others, consists of igneous rock thrown up lava-like from that ancient center at some incalculably remote period of geologic history. For here is neither cone, nor mountain, nor amphitheater of convergent slopes, nothing, in short, in the appearance of either the alluvial flat or the surrounding heights, which may at all correspond to one's preconceived ideas of volcanic scenery. Yet here, as we are told by Richthofen and others, there must once have been a great eruptive center, breaking out again and again, and each time throwing up a different kind of rock, the first cyanite, then tourmaline granite, then urolite porphyry, then melophyr, and then, last of all, porphyrite, and the unique cyanite porphyry, famous for its crystals, and unknown elsewhere. It is this great variety in the material of the Perdazzo rocks, and the immense mineralogical wealth consequent upon this variety, that has, for more than a century, attracted hither so many men of science from all parts of Europe. The town, now quiet enough, except as regards its commercial activity, is said to occupy the center of the ancient crater. It stands, at all events, midway between Cavalese and Moena, just at the junction of the Fiem or Fliems Valley with the Val Trifignolo. It is a very prosperous place. The people, though an Italian-speaking race, are wholly Austrian in their sympathies, and are supposed to come chiefly of a Teutonic stock. They are particularly intelligent, industrious, and energetic. They have a fertile valley, which they know how to cultivate, and mountains rich in mineral products which they are rapidly and successfully developing. As iron masters, as hay merchants, as wood contractors, they carry on an extensive northern trade, and travel annually for purposes of commerce in Germany, Hungary, Transylvania, and Switzerland. Large iron foundries and long lines of busy sawmills give an unwanted air of activity to the place. New works, new yards, new and substantial dwelling-houses are rapidly springing up in every direction. A new Gothic church, with a smart roof of gaily colored tiles, red, green, and yellow, has lately been erected on the south side of the village, and there become the center of an increasing suburb. The schools are said to be excellent, and a well-informed priest, from whom I learned most of the foregoing particulars, said the children were full of spirit and intelligence. He also told me that there were now no noble families in Perdazzo, but only a wealthy, territorial, and commercial middle class. He estimated the gross population of the commune at something over three thousand souls. Prosperity and picturesqueness, however, are not wont to travel hand in hand, and it must be admitted that these foundries and timber-yards by no means add to the pastoral beauty of the valley. They spoil it for the artist, just as the mills and factories of the last twenty years have spoiled the once romantic valley of Glarus in Switzerland. Still, down among the wooden houses in the old part of the village, where the women wash their vegetables and fill their pitchers at the stone fountain in the middle of the street, some quaint, Proust-like subjects may yet be found. The old church, with its characteristic Tyrolese belfry and steep gable roof, is charmingly medieval, and the view from the meadows at the back of the Nave d'Oro, bringing in the two churches and looking straight up at the Val Trevignolo, to where the Simon della Pala and the Sima della Vesaza tower up against the distant horizon, seemed to me quite worth a careful sketch. While I was making the sketch, sitting in the shade of a little shrine among the field paths, two Austrian soldiers came by and stayed to look on. They were simple, friendly fellows, natives of Trient, and quartered, they said, with three others of their regiment in Perdazzo. Not knowing that they acted in the double capacity of local police and military patrol, 
I asked what they could find to do in so peaceful a place. "'Nay, Signora,' said the one who talked most, "'we have the work of ten men upon our hands. Night and day alike we patrol the woods, roads, and passes for twelve miles in every direction. Our rounds are long and fatiguing, our intervals of rest very brief. We get but one day's rest in every seven, and one night in every four or five. I afterwards learned that there were five other soldiers quartered at Cavalese, as many more at Moena, and so on throughout every petty commune, and that, according to the general impression, the men were greatly overworked. The Nave d'Oro, without disparagement of the inns at either Caprile or Primero, was undoubtedly the best albergo we came upon during the whole tour. The house is large, clean, and well furnished the food excellent, and the accommodation in every way of a superior character. The landlord, Francesco Giacomelli, by name, is a sedate, well-informed man, a fair mineralogist, and geologist, and proud to tell of the illustrious savants who have from time to time put up at his house and explored the neighborhood under his guidance. He keeps collections of local minerals for sale, among which the orthoclase crystals struck us as being extraordinarily large and beautiful. Lying among these crystals, in one of Signor Giacomelli's specimen cases, the writer observed a small penannular bronze bracelet of Etruscan pattern and very delicate workmanship, coated with the fine green rust of antiquity, and learned on inquiry that it had been discovered, with other similar objects, in the cutting of a new road, near the neighboring village of Ziano. The find consisted of a sword, a torque, some fibulae, a number of bronze pins, and several bracelets, all of which, with this one exception, were immediately purchased by a Viennese gentleman who chanced to be staying in Predazzo at the time. It is singular that no vases seem to have been found, and no masonry to indicate that the roadmakers had broken into a tomb. It seemed rather as if some warrior had been hastily laid in earth just as he fell. On the other hand, however, this little bracelet, which being accidentally mislaid, had escaped the Viennese collector, and so came to be bought for a few francs by myself, was evidently a female ornament. It is interesting to know that like traces of the northward migration of the Etruscan races, when driven by the Gauls from their settlements on the Po, have been found at Matri, Sonnenberg, and other places of South Tyrol, one notable instance being the discovery of an inscribed bronze bucket near the mouth of the Val de Sembra, which is in fact a westward promulgation of the Fiemme Valley, in 1828. I myself saw, in the little museum of Signor Sartoris at Primero, a small, Arabalos-shaped vase of yellow clay, with red ornamentation, and which they told me had been found by himself in a field not far from the town. Of the remarkable sepulchre discoveries made at St. Ulrich in the Grodnerthal, A.D. 1848, and of Herr Perger's interesting Etruscan objects found in those graves, I shall have to tell farther on. The Nave d'Oro at Perdazzo is a curious old house, and has belonged to the Giacomelli family for many centuries. The Giacomellis, as I have said elsewhere, were once noble, and their armorial bearings still decorate many of the old carved doorways, ceilings, and chimney-pieces of their ancestral home. But that was long ago, and they have been innkeepers now for more than a century. Their visitor's book is quite a venerable volume, and contains, among the usual irrelevant rubbish of such collections, the handwriting of Humboldt, Fuchs, Richthofen, Sir Roderick Murchison, the Isle de Beaumonts, and other European celebrities. But some nefarious autograph hunter has abstracted one of the greatest treasures the book contained, the signature of the discoverer of the Georgium Cetus. Here, too, being one of the latest entries, a certain Dr. Reinhardt of Munich had exercised his latinity in the following pithy sentence. Viator, cave tabernum Bernhardt in Campidello. This ominous caution, so much the more impressive for being so vague, had the effect of deciding us against putting up for a night, or even for a midday rest, at the albergo in question. 
How many travellers since then, I wonder, have, like us, accepted the good doctor's salutary warning? And what would have happened to us if we had neglected it? The Val Fieme, or Flem's Thal, about the middle of which Predazzo is situated, is but one portion of an immensely long, tortuous valley, called in part the Val Fassa, in part the Val Fieme, in part the Val Sembra, which begins with the source of the Aviso in that depression between the Marmolata and the Monte Padon, which is known as the Fadaha Pass, and ends where the torrent debouches into the Isaac at Lavis, seven miles north of Trient. The collective name for this chain of valleys is the Val d'Avisio, and, except at quite the upper end of the Fassa division, it is the least picturesque of any that come within the compass of our journey. Leaving Predazzo after one day of rest, for, however attractive to geologists and mineralogists, it has no excursions to repay the unscientific visitor, we next pursued our course up the valley, proposing to put up for a couple of nights at Vigo in the Fossa Thal, and thence to explore the cirque of the Rosengarten, and ascend the Sasso Dea Mugioni. It is a dull day when we start, having a somewhat dull journey before us. Our way lies at first between a double range of low hills partly clothed with pine forest, and partly with scrub. These hills, which are of the dark, igneous rock thrown up from the Perdazzo crater, hide the loftier peaks, and are not picturesque at all. By and by comes a long straight road, terminated miles away by the village of Moina. Going along this road, a few unmistakably dolomitic summits begin to peer up here and there above the barren hills to the left, and straight ahead, far beyond Moina, rises the Monte Bowie, looking like an immense fort on a grand pedestal of rock, its battlements lost in the clouds. This Monte Bowie, the southernmost bastion of the huge Sella Massive, is also known as the Monte Pordoi. It has been ascended by Dr. Groen, who calculates its height at 10,341 feet. Passing through Moina, a large, straggling, wood-cutting village, and crossing a couple of bridges, we leave the high road and strike up a steep mule path on the opposite bank of the torrent. It is the same valley and the same water, but here above Moina it is called the Fasathal. Looking back from this higher ground, we get a fine view over the Monte Latimer, 8,983 feet, and its far-reaching fir forests, while the wild peaks of the Rosengarten and Lane Kofel come into sight above the lower slopes of the Costa Lunga. End of section 27《Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys》Section 28. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys: A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 11: The Faso Thal and the Fadaha Pass, Part 2. And now, in rich contrast to the pallid Dolomites soaring high in the distance. The famous porphyry of the Fasalthal begins to break out in crimson patches among the lower hills, and to appear in the cliff walls that border the Avisio far below. Yonder, where the stream takes a sudden bend, two isolated porphyry pillars jut out on either side, forming a natural portal through which the narrowed waters push impetuously. A little farther still, and a whole mountainside of the precious marble, quarried terrace above terrace, and apparently of inexhaustible richness, is laid bare to view. Now we recross the stream and pass through the village of Soraga. Here everything except the grass and the trees is crimson. The ploughed fields are crimson, the mud underfoot is crimson, the little torrent hurrying down the ravine by the roadside is crimson, the very puddles are crimson also. Even the roads are mended with porphyry, and great blocks of it lie piled by the wayside, waiting for the hammer of the stone-breaker. The sky, which has all day been murky, now seems to be coming down lower and lower, like a heavy grey curtain. The air grows chill. A cold, leaden tint spreads over the landscape, and the long, dull road seems to grow longer and duller the farther we follow it. At length we come in sight of Vigo, a village clustered high upon a hillside to the left, backed by lofty slopes of fir forest, down which the gathering mists are creeping fast. 
A steep path leads up to the village, whence, looking over to the northeast, where the horizon is still clear, we catch a momentary endwise glimpse of the marmolata. And now we are overtaken by a smiling lad with a bunch of wild strawberries in his hat, who turns out to be young Rizzi, son of old Rizzi, who keeps the albergo up here at Vigo, a large, dark, dreary house, the entrance to which lies through a filthy cart-shed and up a staircase that looks as if it had not been scrubbed for the last half-century. Here we are received by the landlord's daughter, a fat, bouncing, rosy-cheeked damsel of inexhaustible activity and good humor, who does her best to make us welcome. The inn, however, proves to be quite full, with the exception of one big treble-bedded room with windows looking to east and north, and a ceiling about seven feet from the floor. And we are fortunate to secure even this, for before we have been half an hour in possession of it, there arrives a party of Germans, hungry, noisy mountaineers, regularly got up for work, with ropes, ice hatchets, and hobnailed boots, for whom beds have to be made out on the landing. A chill, drizzly evening, a supper irregularly served, and boisterous neighbors in the adjoining rooms, caused us, perhaps unjustly, to take a dislike to Vigo. The house, too, was full of foul smells, and a manure heap in the cow-yard under one of our windows did not help to improve the atmosphere. So when morning came, bringing a sea of white mist that extinguished all the mountain-tops, we decided to start for home as quickly as possible. In vain the fat maiden represented that to-day it would surely rain, and that if we only delayed till to-morrow we should be certain of magnificent views and splendid weather. In vain she exhausted her eloquence to prove the absurdity of our attacking the Fadaha past in mist and rain. We did not believe that it was going to be wet. We knew we could take the Fadaha again from Capriel any day we chose, and we were determined to go home. So by half-past six a.m., behold us on the road again, delighted to get away from Vigo, and hoping for a tolerable day. It is a sweet, fresh morning. The vapors are rolling and rising, the clouds parting, and gray gleams of sunshine gliding now and then across the hillsides. But the mountain-tops continue to be veiled in masses of soft white haze, and only thrust a tusk out here and there. Confident, however, of fine weather, we laugh the fat maiden to scorn, and ride on our way, exulting. The valley now grows in beauty at every turn. At Mazin we come upon a picturesque hamlet with a background of ravine and waterfall, and approaching Campidello, look out anxiously for the strange dolomite pinks that overhang the village. The mist is thick, but there they are, gleaming gray and ghost-like. Here, too, is the little albergo against which we have been warned by Dr. Reinhardt of Munich. It looks rather pretty, but the sight of two extremely dirty and ill-favored dwarves, a man and a woman, who come out upon the balcony to stare at the travelers, quite confirms us in the satisfaction with which we ride past the house. A little higher up the valley we reach the villages of Greece and Canazi, and stopping only for a few minutes at Canazi to feed and water the mules, push on rapidly for the Fadaha. Still the scenery continues to increase in beauty. On the hillsides are corn slopes, woods, and pastures. In the valley a rushing stream babbles among the tamarisk trees and pines. Soon a fine pyramidal mountain, black and precipitous on the one side, sheeted with snow on the other, comes into sight at the head of an opening valley to the right. We take it at first for the Marmolata, but it proves to be the Monte Vernale, a less lofty but far more difficult mountain, still unascended, and calculated at 9,845 feet in height. Now the path turns off to the left, threading the two miserable hamlets of Alba and Peña, and rising rapidly through a grand rocky gorge, which gets finer and more savage the higher it climbs. Steep precipices shut it out on the one hand, and barren slopes battlemented with jagged rocks upon the other. The Avisio, here a mere thread of torrent, foams from rock to rock in innumerable tiny cascades. Wide-spreading firs and larches make a green roof overhead, and the path is carpeted with fragrant spines, upon which the mules tread noiselessly. Presently we come in sight of a fine waterfall that, issuing from a fissure in the face of the great cliff to the right, descends in two bold leaps and vanishes amid the depths of the fir forest below. 
The gorge now closes in nearer and steeper, our upward path being indicated by the giddy windings of a little handrail, which scales the face of a huge rock straight ahead. It is here too steep and slippery for riding, so we dismount and walk. Alas! The fat maiden was right, after all. The mist which has been lightly drifting in our faces for the last half hour now sets in with a will, and becomes a steady pour. Drenched and silent, we toil up the stony path and wish ourselves back at Vigo. An hour hence, says Clementi, we shall come to some chalets and cattle sheds, but there is no hospice to look forward to here, as on many other passes. By and by, however, where the climb attains its worst pitch of steepness and slipperiness, we pass a succession of little carved and colored stazione, nailed at short intervals against the rock, for the benefit of such pious souls as may care to say a few aves by the way, and these lead to a tiny chapel not much bigger than a sentry-box, into which we are thankful to creep for temporary shelter. A wretched crucifixion by some village artist, a few faded wildflowers in a broken mug, and a multitude of votive hearts, arms, legs, eyes, and so forth, in tinsel and colored wax, decorate the little altar, while securely embedded in a niche in the wall, chained, padlocked, and iron-bound, there stands a small coffer with a slit in the lid for the reception of stray soldi. Here, glad of even a few minutes' respite from the pitiless deluge without, we wring the rain from our dripping garments, and divide with the men what we have left of bread and wine, not forgetting the wet and melancholy mules who receive a lump of bread apiece, and are comforted by L with bits of sugar. It is still pouring when we go on again, and it continues to pour steadily. For full another hour we keep on under these pleasant circumstances, always on foot, and then quite suddenly find ourselves close under the western end of the Marmolata. Invisible till this moment, it now looms out all at once in startling proximity. A great blue wrinkled glacier, reaching down out of the mist like a terrible hand, grasps the gray rock overhead, while beyond and above it a vast field of stainless snow slopes up into the clouds, without sign of end or limit. Turning from this grand spectacle to the rocky shelf we have just reached, we find ourselves in a garden of wild flowers. There were none in the gorge below, none by the path side coming up, but here they are beautiful and abundant, as if fair Irene had lately passed this way, the flowers following in her track, as she had sowed them with her odorous foot. Wetter than wet through one can hardly be, so we dispatch Clementi up the rock to fetch some bunches of the rare, white, velvety edelweiss, while we quickly gather such lower plants as grow within easy reach. Thus, in the pelting rain, we secure some specimens of the Orobus lutens, Dryas octopatella, Primula farinosa, Pinguicula grandifora, Sinantium vincitoxicum, Orchis nigra, and etc., and etc., besides several varieties of cyclamen, gentians, and ferns. Again a little higher, and we reach the summit of the pass, a lonely upper world of rich sward, bounded on the left by the splintered peaks of Monte Padon, and on the right by the lower slopes of the Marmolata, which rises directly from the grassy level on which we stand. This is the Piana Fedaja, or Fedaja Alp. A dozen or so of rough wooden chalets are here clustered together, mere cattle refuges and hay sheds, one of which, being a trifle more airtight than the rest, is decorated with a colored Christus over the doorway, and serves as a sleeping place for travelers who are about to make the ascent of the mountain. The rain now abates somewhat of its violence, and, the way being once more level, riding again becomes practicable. Thus we go on, a second and a third great glacier creeping into sight as the first is left behind. These each show a brown margin of moraine, the last glacier being of immense extent, as large, apparently, as the lower glacier of Grindelwald. While we are yet looking at them, however, a tall, strange, ghost-like mist stalks swiftly across the snow and veils all but the brown rocks abutting on the pass. In a moment the great mountain has melted away, and we see it no more. 
The Fedaha Alp is just the width of the Marmolata, and no more. It begins with the western, and ends with the eastern extremity of the mountain. Here, at the foot of the huge dark rock known as the Piz Seranta, lies an exquisite little dark green tarn, surrounded by a slopes of crimson alp roses. The rain having now ceased for a moment, its waters, ruffled only by the flight of a small brown moorhen, are as placid as a sheet of green glass. Another yard or two of rocky path, and we come to an upright, mossy stone bearing an illegible inscription. This is the ancient boundary stone between Italy and Austria, one of the few divisions left unchanged at the last readjustment of the frontier line. Half of the Marmolata belongs to the House of Habsburg, and half to the Kingdom of Italy. The line of demarcation is ingeniously carried along the topmost ridge of ice glacier, so that, unless by members of the different European alpine clubs, it is not very likely to become a disputed territory. From this point all is descent. Our way lies along a vast green slope, following the course of the Candieri torrent, but running for a long distance upon the brink of a ruinous gully partly choked with yet unmelted snow. For the path on the Candieri side has been lately swept away by a torrent of snow and water from the Marmolata, and the whole mountain slope is here one mass of soft red mud, more slippery than ice, full of pits and fissures, and very difficult. Lower down still the track lies through the rich, park-like pastures deep in wildflowers, so bringing us at last to the upper end of the Sotoguda Gorge. No sooner have we entered the defile than the clouds clear off as if by magic. The sun then bursts out in splendor, lighting up the rocks, first on one side and then on the other, according as the ravine winds its narrow way. Our wet garments steam as if hung before a blazing fire. The men take off their coats and carry them on their alpenstocks to dry. The mules prick their ears and rub their noses together, as if whispering to each other that there is a scent of home upon the air, and that the old familiar stable cannot surely be far distant. Nor is it, for already we have emerged into the Val Petorina. These green slopes to the left are the slopes of Monte Mignon. Those fir woods to the right are the woods of Monte Pesa. Presently come the dilapidated hamlets of Sotoguda and Sorara, then Rocca on its hillside, then the familiar path down by the torrent side and across the wooden bridge, then at last Caprile, where a warm welcome awaits us, a heap of English letters, and a rest. End of section 28《Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys》A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards Chapter 12 The Sasso Bianco Part 1 An ill-favored thing, sir, says Touchstone, the article in question being a lady, but mine own. Now, I will not say that the Sasso Bianco is an ill-favored mountain, heaven forbid, nor that it is an unimportant mountain, nor even that it is a small mountain. I will not deprecate it at the beginning in order to rehabilitate it by a coup de theatre in the end. Neither will I affect to undervalue it for the sake of establishing an ingenious parallel between myself and the fool. At the same time, I am anxious not to exaggerate its peculiar qualifications and virtues. For it is with mountain-tops as with other playthings. Having sought to achieve them in the first instance because we value them, we go on valuing them because we have achieved them. We may even admit their ill-favoredness, as Touchstone admits the ill-favoredness of Audrey, but we are apt at the same time to overestimate them in secret, simply because they are our own. I premise, therefore, that I am not blindly in love with the Sasso Bianco, and that the following portrait is not flattered. I cannot better describe the Sasso Bianco than by adopting the words of Clementi. It is not a mountain of the first class, but it is high for a mountain of the second class. It is, for instance, two thousand feet, if not twenty-two hundred feet, higher than the Rigi, and about two hundred and forty feet higher than the Nisan. Its summit stands about two hundred feet higher above the lake of Alleghi 
than the summit of Monte Generosa above the lake of Lugano. It rises considerably above the tree line, and falls just short of the snow level. That is to say, we found one unmelted snowdrift about one hundred feet below the summit, and there may have been others which we did not see lurking in inaccessible fissures and crevices. The snow was firm and pure, but the quantity insignificant. As regards position, I know of no minor Swiss mountain to which I can accurately compare the Sasso Bianco. The Rigi is a mere outlying sentinel, and the view it commands is too distant to be very striking. The same may be said of Monte Generosa, despite its unparalleled panoramic range. The Egeshorn view is all on one side. The Gornergrat, unrivaled as a near view over snow and ice, is too circumscribed. But the Sasso Bianco stands in the very center of the Dolomites, like the middle ball upon a solitaire board, surrounded on all sides by the giants of the district. If one could imagine a fine, detached mountain, clear on all sides, occupying, say, the position of the village of Luc in the valley of the Rhone, and high enough to command the whole circuit of the Oberland, Monte Rosa, and Mont Blanc rages, that mountain would fairly represent the kind of position which the Sasso Bianco holds in reference to the scenery by which it is encompassed. I am not acquainted with the view from the Bella Tola in the valley of the Rhone, but judging from its situation on the map, it seems just possible that it may supply exactly the parallel of which I am in search. The mass of Monte Pezza is of considerable extent. Counting from the points locally known as Monte Alto on the west and Monte Forca on the east, and from the Val Petorina on the north to the valley of the Buas on the south, it must cover a space of nearly three and a half miles in length by two and a half in breadth. These, of course, are only rough measurements derived partly from personal observation, and partly based upon the Austrian ordnance map. In superficial extent as well as in height, the Sasso Bianco, or more properly the Monte Pezza, much exceeds the Monte Mignon, the Monte Frisolet, and Monte Fernanza. Of the geology of the mountain I am not competent to form an opinion, but according to Ball's geological map it is composed in part of Porphyry and in part of Triassic, the light-colored cliffs of the summit facing north, being the part especially designated as the Sasso Bianco, are probably dolomite. Both in color and in texture the rock appears, at all events, to be of one piece with that of which the great Primiero and Empezo peaks are composed. Of course we decided upon making the ascent almost as soon as we found ourselves back at Caprile. The way up, though long, seemed to be sufficiently easy. There were many paths and char tracks leading from the valley of Alleghi to the farmlands and hamlets scattered along the eastern side of the mountain, but Clementi recommended a path starting from the Val Petrina, along which we must ride, he said, as far as the highest pastures, and to within about an hour of the summit. As regarded time, he calculated that from four to five hours, including the last hour on foot, would take us from Caprile to the summit. All this sounded pleasant enough, so it was arranged that Giuseppe should watch the weather and rouse the household at three a.m. whenever a favorable morning should offer. At length, on the morning of the fourth day after our return, the weather being apparently favorable, Giuseppe gave the signal a little before dawn, and by five a.m. we were upon our way. A more lovely morning we have never yet had. The grass, the wild flowers, the trees, all are drenched with dew and sparkling in the sun. The birds seem wild with delight, and are singing like mad upon the wet green leaves. Crossing the wooden bridge, and taking the familiar road up the little Val Petorina, as if going to Sotaguda, we hear the bells of Rocca ringing high up in the still air, and pass group after group of peasants in their holiday clothes making for the hill. For it is a festa this bright morning, and the annual Segro is held at Rocca to-day. Men and women alike pull off their hats as we ride by. All wish us good morning, and none fail to ask where we are going. Turning away presently from the beaten path, we then strike down to the water's edge, the mules picking their way along the loose stones bordering the bed of the Petarina torrent. Skirting thus the base of the hill on which Rocca is built, we cross a higher bridge and plunge at once into the shade of the fir woods at the northward base of Monte Pezza. The path, which is steep and stony, then winds round to the east, 
and brings us out upon a space of cultivated farmlands just overhanging the Cordeval. Here dark firwoods slope in shade down to the valley below, and higher firwoods climb the mountain side above, while between both a belt of green cornfields, lighted here and there by fiery sparks of scarlet poppies, ripples in the breeze and the sunshine. Peeping up yonder, just beyond the brink of the woods, rises the spire of Capriel, while further still a faint ghost of white vapor soars lazily up from the direction of Alleghi. Presently a lark springs out, full-voiced, from his nest in the barley, and a troop of children, their little brown hands full of poppies and cornflowers, come chasing each other down the mountain-side. Such, indeed, is the idyllic beauty of the whole scene that even L., who, with a culpable indifference to glory which it grieves me to record, was more than half inclined to stay at home, is moved to admiration, and admits that, were it to see no more than this, she is glad to have come. Meanwhile we follow a series of narrow footways winding among fields of young wheat, barley, flax, and hemp. Dark Nestle, a confirmed kleptomaniac, grabs huge mouthfuls right and left, and leaves a trail of devastation behind him. Fair Nestle, on the contrary, looks and longs, but obeying the light hand on his bridle, abstains regretfully. Presently we leave the fields behind, and mount again into the shade of the forest. Here and there, where the path is very steep, we dismount and walk. Still higher we emerge upon a zone of rich grassland full of busy haymakers, and learn that all this part belongs to Signora Pezzi. Twenty-four such pasturages are yet hers, but half the mountainside belonged to the family in the old times passed away. From this point, and for a long way up, the pasture land is like a lovely park, rich in grass and interspersed with clumps of firs and larches. As the path rises, however, the trees diminish and the wild flowers become more abundant. Soon we are in the midst of a hanging garden, thick with white and yellow violets, forget-me-nots, great orange and turkscap lilies, wild sweet peas, wild sweet william, and purple canterbury bells. Here, too, we make acquaintance for the first time with a grotesque, ugly flower, bearing a kind of fibrous crest, like a top-knot of spider's legs. They call it Capelli di Dio, or God's Hair. The forget-me-not is here called Fior di Santa Lucia, or St. Lucy's Flower, and the white clover, known only as a wild flower in South Tyrol, is the Fior di San Giovanni, or Flower of St. John. Looking back now towards Monte Mignon, I see that we have long ago overtopped the Sasso di Ranch, which from here looks no bigger than a milestone and that we are already higher than the highest ridge of Monte Frisolet. Meanwhile, however, the morning dews keep rising in white, vaporous masses from the depths of the valley below, threatening before long to intercept the view. If they should rise to our own level when once we are at the top, as they seem only too likely to do, it is plain that our chances of a panoramic view are lost beyond redemption. And now the wildflower zone is left below, and the path, which here circles round a vast amphitheatre in the mountainside, gets very steep, and strikes up towards the last pasturages. Steep as it is, however, and hewn in places out of the slippery rock, the farmers have for centuries contrived to drag their rough caratini up and down when the highest hay is gathered. The rock is even worn into deep ruts, just as the pavement of the Via Triumphalis is channeled by Roman chariot wheels, where it climbs the steep verge of Monte Cavo. Here the mules scramble on first, and reaching the green levels above, set off on their own accord. In vain Clementi runs and shouts after them. They trot resolutely on, till, reaching a little hollow among bushes and deep grass, they bury their noses in a cool rill which they had scented from afar off. Clementi, coming up red and breathless, wrenches their heads out of the water, and overwhelms them with reproaches. Holy Mother! What do they mean by not minding when they are spoken to? Holy Mother! What do they mean by drinking cold water when they are as hot as two hot cakes in an oven? Sacramento! Do they want to fall ill and die, out of mere spite towards a master who loves them? Eh, long years! Are they deaf? Ah, oh, monsters of mules! Do they not understand Italian?' It is a long, grassy, trough-shaped plateau, with a few gnarled, bloodless old pines scattered about, and two or three tumble-down chalets. Here the char-track ends, 
but we take the mules on a good way farther still, up a steep pitch at the far end of the pasture alp, and out at last upon a broad ridge terminated towards the northeast by a long slope and an upright wall of rock, like a line of fortification. To right and left, this ridge dips away into unfathomable chasms of misty valley, to the southwest it runs down to join the great woods which clothe all the western mass of Monte Pesa. There is nothing, in short, above the point which we have now reached, save the slope leading to the summit. But where is the summit? Seeing us look eagerly towards the rock wall above, Clementi laughs and shakes his head. Ah, no, signoras, he says, non ancora. We must leave the mules here, but from this point we have an hour's walking before us. The cima is yonder, seven or eight hundred feet higher. It proves, however, to be over a thousand. The mists, alas, are now swirling up on this side with frightful rapidity. The Val Petorina and all the Sotogoda side are hidden by the slope above, but the Val d'Alleghi and the Civita and all the peaks lying to the southwest of our position are now only visible in snatches as the vapors drift in part. The Val Bois, looking over towards Sensenigi and the Cima de Pape, is like a huge cauldron sending up volumes of swift steam. To go on at present is obviously useless, so we make armchairs of the saddles and rest a while upon the grass, while the mules graze and the men, who have had more than four hours climbing, light their cigars and lie down in the shade of a big boulder. Up here we are already above the tree level. Glowing alp roses and dark blue gentians abound, but the grass all about grows thin and hungerly. According to the aneroid, and without allowing anything for corrections, we have already left Caprile more than thirty-five hundred feet below. That is to say, we have attained an elevation two hundred feet higher than the Fadaha Pass, and between twenty and thirty feet higher than the Tresasi Pass, where it will be remembered we reached the snow level. Half an hour is consumed thus, in calculating heights, examining maps, and watching the progress of the mists. Sometimes the sun breaks through, and then they part for a moment and drive off in rolling masses. Sometimes they rush up as if chased by the wind, sweeping all across the ridge, blinding us in white fog, and leaving clinging damp behind them. At length we decide to push on for the summit. Clementi, who knows this climate, thinks it may clear off at midday, and that we may as well be upon the spot to take advantage of any sudden change for the better. It is now 10.20 a.m., and we have an hour's climbing before us. Meanwhile, a little lad who has been picked up on the way is left in charge of the mules, with strict injunctions not to let them stray near the edge of the precipice on either side, a duty which he fulfills by immediately lying down upon his face in the damp grass and falling sound asleep. End of section 29「ウィークス・アンフレクテッド・バリー」セクション30「ウィークス・アンフレクテッド・バリー」セクション30「ウィークス・アンフレクテッド・バリー」「ウィークス・アンフレクテッド・バリー」「ウィークス・アンフレクテッド・バリー」「ウィークス・アンフレクテッド・バリー」そうこうしてスローリーバッドリーアップのロングスロープアンアンテッドのロックワーラフォーセッド」Here are no steps ready hewn. We have to get up as best we can, and the getting up is not easy. The little crevices and inequalities which serve as footholds are in places so far apart that it is like going up the steps of the great pyramid, and but for Giuseppe, who goes first in order to do duty as a kind of wand lass, the rider, for one, would certainly never have surmounted the barrier. This stiff little bit over we expect to see some sign of the summit, but on the contrary find ourselves, apparently, as far from it as ever. A second and a third slope still rise up ahead, as barren and unpromising as the last. And now even the alp rose has disappeared, and not a bush of any kind breaks the monotony of the surface. But the gentians make a blue carpet underfoot, and the edelweiss, so rare elsewhere, so highly prized, flourishes in lavish luxuriance like a mere weed, Presently we pass an unmelted snowdrift in a hollow some little way below the summit. Then, quite suddenly, a whole army of distant peaks begins to start into sight, 
and so, after six hours, we all at once find ourselves upon the top. We might, of course, have had a better day, but it is some reward after long toil to find the view to north and west quite free from mist. The vapors are still boiling up in the south and southeast, but not, perhaps, quite so persistently as an hour ago. At all events they part from time to time, so that in the end, by dint of patient watching, we see all the near peaks in those quarters. It is now nearly half-past eleven o'clock, and having eaten nothing since five, we are all as hungry as people have a right to be, at an altitude of between four and five thousand feet above the breakfast-table. So before attempting to verify peaks, or heights, or relative distances of any kind, we call for the luncheon-basket, and turn with undiminished gusto to the familiar meal of hard-boiled eggs and bread. The water in the flask being flat, Clementi fetches up a great lump of snow, and this, melted in the sun and mixed with a little brandy, makes a delicious draught as cold as ice itself. In the midst of this frugal festivity, Giuseppe, with the keen eye of a chamois hunter, recognizes El's maid, whom he calls the Signora Cameraria, on the Cordeval Bridge just outside the village. We see only a tiny black speck, no bigger than a pin's head, but Clementi goes so far as to depose her parasol. In a moment they are both up, tying a pocket handkerchief to a white umbrella, and lashing the umbrella upon an alpenstock, which they erect for a signal, and the excitement caused by this does not subside till the black speck, after remaining stationary upon the bridge for about a quarter of an hour, creeps slowly away and is lost to sight in the direction of Caprile. Luncheon over, we set to work with maps and field-glasses to identify all that is visible of the panorama. We are sitting now on the brink of the great yellowish cliffs that the writer sketched a little while back from below the Sasso di Ranch. All the heights and valleys on this side lie spread out before us, like the surface of a relief map. We look down upon the Monte Mignon and Monte Frisolet, both green to the top and scattered over with hamlets, farms, cultivated fields, and fir forest. Monte Mignon, estimated by Trinker at 7,838 feet, lies full 400 feet below, and Monte Frisolet considerably lower still. The Val Pettorina opens just under our feet, and one could almost drop a stone down into the little piazza of Rocca, where the Segro is going on merrily. We can see the peasants moving to and fro between the church and a great white booth, on the top of which a red flag is flying. Now and then, when the wind comes up this way, it brings faint echoes of the bells, and the braying of a brass band. As for the holiday folks, they look exactly like a swarm of very small black insects, all in motion. Monte Fernanza, farther to the right, appears to be considerably lower than Monte Miglion, but not so low as Monte Frisolet. Except for a blackish ridge of igneous rock, cropping out on the side of the pass of the Alleghi, this mountain is green and cultivated like the other two, and is apparently about 6,500 feet in height. So much for the minor mountains in our immediate neighborhood. Of the larger, the two nearest, each being distant about two miles in a direct line, are the Marmolata and the Civita. The last fills all the southeastern division of the horizon. Large masses of vapor flit from time to time across the face of that vast, fretted screen, but they flit and pass away, and it lifts its noble head continually into the clear blue depths of the upper sky. The Marmolata stands up in bold profile, undimmed by even a thread of vapor. Mr. Gilbert, seeing this mountain from the Sasso di Dam, and getting it also in profile, though from the western end, compared it to a huge stationary case, its vertical side to the south, and its long snow slope to the north. But taken here from the east end, whence one more clearly sees the sharp depression, or couloir, that divides the peaks, it absurdly resembles the familiar cocked hat worn by the first Napoleon the precipitous side being of course the front of the hat, and the snow slope corresponding to the back. A great stream of snow lies in the cleft of the collier, and all the northward slope is outlined, as it seemed, in frosted silver, 
but the great glaciers and snowfields that lie to the Fedeja are from here invisible. The green threshold of the Fedeja Pass and the low jagged ridge of the Monte Padon rise just north of the extreme eastern end of the Marmolata, which is buttressed on this side by the black precipices of Saranta. Monte Vernale, repeating from here as from Canazzi its curious resemblance to the Marmolata, lurks close under the southward wall of its huge neighbor, being divided from it by only a little green slope considerably higher than the Fadaha Pass, which Clementi points out as the Forcella Contrine, 9,052 feet, and which is also known as the Forcella di Val Ombretta, and as the Passo di Val Freda. Still lower down towards the southwest lies the Sasso di Valfreda, still unascended. A little beyond it comes the Monte Rigobetta, locally known as the Monzon, 8,634 feet in height, and on the same parallel, but still farther west, Monte Latimar, on whose summit the vapors rest all day. Northwest of the Marmolata, about nine miles distant as the crow flies, rise the snow-streaked bastions of the Sella Massive, of which, however, only two great towers, the Boe and the Campolongo Spitz, are seen from this side, while in an opening between the Boe and the Marmolata rises a noble, solitary rock, which proves to be the Long Cofo, 10,392 feet in height, and distant about thirteen English miles. A tiny glimpse of the Rosengarten is also seen in the gap above the Forcella de Contrine. Returning now to the point from which we started, and looking due north straight over the top of Monte Miguel, the pinky snow-streaked line of the Set Sass, divided from Monte Lagosui by the Valparola Pass, comes into view. The Sasso di Stria, which looked so imposing from near by, here shows as a small pyramidal rock of no importance. The crystallated crest of Monte Nuvalu dwindles to a tiny ridge on a long green slope. The Caretta track of the Tre Sassi Pass winds between both like a white thread, and Monte Tofana, as usual, sulky and cloud-capped, shows its pyramidal front only once, when the mists roll apart for a few moments. Following the parallel of the Tofana, we get misty glimpses of the Cristalino Peaks, of the Cristallo, of the Drezinen, Sorapis and the Crota Malcora. The Rochetta and the fantastic ridge of the Bec de Mezzodi divide them off like a fence, while straight away to the east the Pelmo shows every now and then, quite clear from base to summit. Between the Pelmo and the Crota Malcora, part of the range of the Marmolo and the curved prow of the Lantaleo peep out through window-like openings in the clouds. Finally, above and beyond all these, ranging from northwest to northeast, in the only direction where the horizon is permanently clear, we look over towards a sea of very distant peaks, reaching far away into the heart of northern Tyrol. To the northwest, a little above and to the left of the Set Sass Ridge, we recognize by help of the map the highest summits of the Zitherthal Alps, the Fustein near the Brenner Pass, 11,451 feet in height, the five peaks of the Hornspitzen, ranging from 10,333 feet to 10,842 feet, and Hochfehler, 11,535 feet. Due north, exactly above the Setzass, a long snow range glowing in the midday sun identifies itself with the Ansolar Alps beyond Bruneck, the highest points of which are the Wildgau, 10,785 feet, the Schneebigsnock, 11,068 feet, and the Hochgall, still, I believe, unascended, and rising to 11,284 feet. Beyond these again, to the north-northwest, Clementi believes that he recognizes the Drehern Spites, 11,492 feet, and the Gross Vendiger, 12,053 feet, these last being full 45 miles distant as the crow flies. Turning now from the northern half of the horizon, where all is so clear, it is doubly disappointing to face the mists which still keep pouring up from the south. Parting here and there at times, as if rent suddenly by gusts of wind from the southwest, they show now the tremendous wall of the Simon della Pala, now the Castellazzo over against the Costanzella Pass, and behind the Costellaza the Cima d'Asti, 
now all the great Primero peaks in detached glimpses, from the Palle di San Martino to the Sasso di Campo. The Palle di San Lucano, which rises due south of our position, also gleams out now and then, as also does the volcanic cone of the Cima di Pape. What might be visible on this side under more favorable circumstances, it is, of course, impossible to say. But I am inclined to think that the southward view, including as it does the Primiero group, would be finer than that from Monte Pavione, which is some two hundred feet lower than the Sasso Bianco. As it is, even, with one half of the horizon continually obscured, we succeed in identifying over fifty great summits, including all the Dolomite giants. I should be afraid to conjecture how many peaks which could not be verified with certainty must have been in sight. It was at the time, and is still, a matter of regret to the writer not to have been able to make some kind of panoramic outline, however rough, of the view from the summit. But it would have been useless to make the attempt under such heavy disadvantages, not more than forty-five degrees of horizon being absolutely clear at any time. As regards the height of the Sasso Bianco, there can, I think, be no doubt that it rather exceeds than falls below eight thousand feet. A traveller more experienced in the use of the aneroid would doubtless be able to determine the matter to within a few feet, but I should myself be very diffident of giving a decided measurement. We observed the aneroid closely all the way from Caprile to the summit, and found that it rose four thousand five hundred English feet. This, without any correction for the mean temperature of the column of air between the upper and lower stations, if added to the height at which Caprile stands above the sea level, namely 3,376 feet, would give an elevation of 7,876 feet. The temperature, however, varied greatly, the heat being intense as we round round the mountain from east to south, and the change to cold and damp being very sudden when we came into the mists a thousand feet below the summit. These mists, however, never rose to the height of the actual summit during the whole two hours that we remained upon the top. On the contrary, the sun shone uninterruptedly, and the temperature must have stood at from seventy to seventy-five. Not venturing myself to deduce results from these imperfect observations, I have submitted my notes to an eminent mountaineer, whose opinion I prefer to give in his own words. Assuming the temperature to be respectively fifty and seventy, we should have a correction of two hundred and eighty feet, which must be added to your forty-five hundred. The height would then come out three thousand three hundred seventy-six plus forty-five hundred plus two hundred and eighty to eight thousand one hundred and fifty-six feet so that I think you may safely put it at over eight thousand feet. In your letter you spoke of your peak being four hundred to six hundred feet higher than Monte Mignon. Now, Trinker gives the latter as seven thousand eight hundred thirty-eight feet, which would bring the Sasso Bianco up to eight thousand two hundred thirty-eight, or eight thousand four hundred thirty-eight feet, so that in this way you too get the estimate of over eight thousand feet confirmed. F. F. T. For the present, then, and until some more competent traveller shall determine this point with accuracy, the height of the Sasso Bianco may be allotted to stand at something over eight thousand feet. Having spent two hours on the top, and seeing no hope of any change for the better on the southern side, we reluctantly packed up and came down. By the time we reached Signora Pezzi's pasturages, the Segro was breaking up in Rocca, and the Contadini, who lived in the scattered farms and cottages of Monte Pezza, were coming up homewards. All asked if we had had a good view, if we were very tired, if we had found it difficult, and how long it had taken us to get to the top. Brava, brava, said one old man. So, signoras, you have been up our mountain, e bene, e una bella montagna. But you are the first forestieri who have cared to find it out. It was amusing to see how pleased, and even flattered, they all seemed, as if being born and bred upon the mountain, they took the expedition as an indirect compliment paid to themselves. When at length we reached Caprile, it was just half-past five o'clock. We had been gone precisely twelve hours and a half. That is to say, we had been six hours getting to the top, including stoppages, and four hours and a half, including another stoppage, coming down. We might, of course, as I have already said, have had a better day. We might, as I fully believe, 
there being an almost continuous line of valleys, and no mountain range of any importance between, have seen straight down to Venice and the Adriatic on the south, to the Lake of Garda on the southeast, and perhaps, if the Marmolata is not in the way, to the Ortler Spites on the east. In any case the view to the north and northwest was extremely fine, and the near view over the whole surrounding group of Dolomites, which is of more importance than any distant view of peaks which are continually seen from other heights, is of the greatest interest. I doubt, indeed, if there can be any other point from which all the giants of the district can be seen at once, and to so much advantage. End of section 30「Unfrequented Valleys」section 31. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 13 Forno di Zelda and Zoppe, Part 1. There remained yet another important excursion to be taken from Caprile before we could finally break up our camp and depart. We must go over the pass of Alleghe, visit the Val di Zoldo, make a pilgrimage to a certain village called Zoppe, where a Titian was to be seen, and come home by way of the Val Fiorentino. Now the main attractions of this expedition did not appear upon the surface. We had been over a good many passes already, and through a good many valleys, and had been plentifully pelted with Titians of all degrees of genuineness. But what we really wanted was to see the back of the Civita, and to get a near view of the Pelmo. As both of these ends would be answered by following the route thus laid down, and as the expedition was guaranteed not to exceed three days, we once more packed our black bags, stocked the luncheon basket, rose at daybreak one fine morning, and departed. This time young Cesare Pese, the ex Girobaldian, having a married sister living at Piev di Zoldo, whom he wished to see, volunteered to walk with us, a soldierly, upright, picturesque fellow, with his coat flung loosely across one shoulder, a yellow silk handkerchief tied cornerwise round his throat, a bunch of carnations in his hat, and an alpenstock in his hand. This time, as last time, our way lies at first beside the lake, but strikes away presently behind the village of Alleghi, and up a delicious little valley, thick with walnuts and limes, and threaded by a bright torrent, that fills many a moss-grown water-trough, and turns many an old brown wheel. The path, rising and winding continually, passes farmlands and farmhouses, barns, orchards, gardens, green slopes striped with rows of yellow flax laid down to bleach in the sun, and terrace after terrace of wheat, barley, flax, hemp, potatoes, and glossy-leafed, tassel-blossomed Indian corn. And as the path rises, so also rises the Civita, its lower precipices detaching themselves in grand proportions from the main mass, while every riven pinnacle, spire, obelisk, and needle-point, stands out sharply against the deep blue sky. Thus the mountain grows in grandeur with every upward foot of the way. White patches that looked like snowdrifts from the valley now show as glaciers coated with snow, through which the blue ice glitters, and by and by, as we draw still nearer, another of those strange circular holes, or ochi as they are here called, stares down at us from near the top of a small peak, like a hole drilled in a dagger blade. So, with exquisite glimpses over the bluish green lake, we emerge at length from the gorge, and climb a steep, stony lane with never a tree on either side to screen off the burning sun. Suddenly a long, steel-blue snake, speckled with white, darts out from under the very feet of white nestle. Clementi utters a wild war-whoop, L a scream, the mule a snort of terror. Giuseppe and young Pezzi leap forward with their sticks, and in a second the poor reptile, which is as thick as one's wrist and about four feet in length, but I believe quite harmless, lies dead by the wayside. The stony path now leads out upon a wild and desolate mule-track skirting the grim flanks of Monte Fernanza, 
a gruesome mountain whose low black precipices have crashed down before now in many a bergfall, covering the barren slopes with shattered debris and huge purply blocks all blistered over with poisonous-looking lichens. Winding now round the head of the glen by which we have come up from Alleghi, we arrive at last upon a grassy plateau at the foot of an overhanging cliff which, though locally called the Monte Caldai, is in truth the huge northeastern shoulder of the Civita. Above here, in a hollow among the rocks, nestles a small tarn called the Lago Caldi, said to command a fine view, but which we had not time to climb to. Beyond Monte Caldai, the way lies up a fine rock-strewn gorge, just like the gorge of the Evisio, where it leads up to the Fedaja Alp. Gradually we lose sight of the long, fretted façade of the Civita, which retires behind the Cordai rocks, and looking back find that the lake has sunk quite out of sight. The Sasso Bianco, which till now had been standing out against the sky, has all at once dropped below the horizon, and is immeasurably overtopped by the towering altitudes of the Marmolata. The Boe, the Cima di Pape, the Monte Vernale, the Sasso di Valfreda, and many another now familiar peak have also risen into view. But it is the Marmolata that claims all one's attention, and seems to fill the scene. Presently an obstinate cloud that has been clinging to the highest point of the summit clears off little by little, and leaves the whole noble mass distinctly relieved against the western sky. Guardate, says young Pese, seeing a sketch in preparation, La Marmolata has thrown her veil aside to have her portrait taken. It is a grand view of the mountain, even though its snows and glaciers are all out of sight. From here, as from the Sassi Bianco, one sees its true form and its actual summit, while of the one no idea can be formed, and of the other no vestige is visible from either the Tresasse or the Fidaja. Clementi can even identify the tiny topmost patch of snow on which F.F.T., placed his barometer when he reached the summit. And now a grassy call, about a quarter of an hour ahead, is pointed out as the summit of the pass. There we shall see the mountains of Val di Zoldo, and take our midday rest in whatever shady spot we can find. There, too, as young Pese pleasantly prophesies, we shall be within reach of a chalet where milk and even cream may be purchased. So we press on eagerly, but stopping suddenly a little below the top, are amazed to see the Pelmo, snow-ridged, battlemented, stupendous, chewed up all at once, as it seems, from behind the slopes and fir-woods to the left of the pass, as near to us as the Civita. Large masses of vapor are rising and falling round those mighty towers, never leaving them wholly uncovered for an instant, but they look all the mightier for that touch of mystery." And now, a few yards higher, and the Marmolata, the Sasso Bianco, and the Boe, and all the rest disappear altogether, and a lovely grassy plain dotted over with strewn rocks and clumps of firs, and bounded by a line of mountain peaks as wild and fantastic as anything we have yet seen, lies spread out in sunshine before us. This, according to the map, must be the grand chain of which the Monte Promper and Monte Piesadel both as yet unascended, are the dominating summits. Up here we encamp for an hour and a half, sub-jove, and the mules graze while we take luncheon. Clementi vanishes up the hillside, and returns by and by with a bowl of cream in each hand, which, beaten up with wine and sugar, and eaten in the midst of such a scene, is at least as delicious as the dulcet creams prepared by Eve for the angel's entertainment. Meanwhile the cowherd comes down from the chalet to stare at the forest dairy, and is so overpaid with half a lira that I begin to fear we must have given him a piece of gold by mistake. A deep, narrow gorge now leads down from a little below the summit of the pass, to a point whence the Val di Zodo, sunny, cultivated, sparkling with villages and spires, opens out far and wide beneath our feet. And now, at last, we see the back of the Civita. Accustomed as one has become to the strangely different aspects under which a dolomite is capable of presenting itself, from opposite points of the compass, here is a metamorphosis which the most erratic imagination could never have foreseen. 
To say that the Civita is unrecognizable from the Zoldo side is to say nothing, for the mountain is so strangely unlike itself that, although one has, so to say, but just turned the corner of it, the discrepancy in form, in character, and apparently also in extent, is almost past acceptance. Calm, perpendicular, majestic on the side of a legge, here it is wild, tossed, tormented, and irregular. From a legge it appears as a vast, upright, symmetrical screen. Here it consists of a long succession of huge, straggling buttresses divided by wild glens, the birthplaces of mists and torrents. If from Capriel the mountain looks, as I have said more than once, like a mighty organ, from here it seems as if each vertical pipe in that organ front were but the narrow end of rock, in which each of these buttresses terminates. Looking at them thus in lateral perspective, I can compare them, wild and savage as they are, to nothing, save that vista of exquisitely carved and decorated flying buttresses just below the roof of Milan Cathedral, which is known as the Giardino Botanico. The Civita was first ascended by Mr. F. F. Tuckett, who gives the height at about 10,440 feet. The summit, snow-crowned and lonely, is plainly seen from this side, and looks as if it might be reached without serious difficulty. The valley of Zoldo is richly cultivated, the farmhouses are solidly built, and the whole district wears a face of smiling prosperity. The usual little dusty hamlets with the usual religious frescoes on the principal house fronts, the usual little white church, and the usual village fountain, follow one another rather more thickly than in most other valleys. At San Nicolo, where the valley narrows and the rocks close in upon the rushing may far below, we enter upon an excellent carriage road, which goes from this point, by an immense detour, to Longaron. At a certain village called Dant, some way below San Nicolo, we had proposed to pass the night, but being daunted by the dirt and general disorder of the inn, push on for Forno di Zoldi, where Ball's guide reports comfortable quarters at Cercena's inn. Here we arrive at the end of another three quarters of an hour, and alight at the door of a very large, very old, and very dirty-looking house up a small steep street in the heart of the village. Passing through a gloomy stone kitchen where some fifteen or twenty harvesters are eating polenta out of wooden platters, we are shown up a dark staircase and into a large room, the floor of which is encrusted with the filth of centuries. The sofa, the chairs, the window curtains look as if dropping to pieces with age and only held together by cobwebs. The windows open on a steep side lane where all the children in the place presently congregate for no other purpose than to flatten their noses against the panes and stare at us, till candles are brought and curtains can be drawn to exclude them. As for the landing, which in most other Tyrolean inns is the cleanest and smartest place in the house, it is the dreariest wilderness of old furniture, old presses, old saddles and harnesses, sacks, undressed skins, and dusty lumber of all kinds that was ever seen or heard of outside the land of the dawn. Yet the Cercenas, themselves, are well-mannered, superior people, and their forefathers have owned estates in Val di Zoldo for over five hundred years. The daughter-in-law of the house, a pretty, refined-looking young woman, waits upon us, and is made quite wretched by our few and modest requirements. We are not, I think, unreasonable travellers, but we have been riding and walking for nearly twelve hours, and wish not unnaturally for water, towels, food, and coffee. For all these things we have to wait interminably. That we should require a tablecloth is a serious affliction, and that we cannot sup like the haymakers off polenta is almost more than young Signora Sarsena knows how to bear. A few small lumps of smoke-blackened meat, a dish of unwashed salad, and some greasy fritters are at length brought, and this young lady, while professing, I imagine, to wait at table, walks over quite coolly to a looking-glass at the farther end of the room, and there deliberately tries on L's hat and all my rings and bracelets. It is a dreadful supper, and is followed by a dreadful night, hot and close and wakeful, and enlivened in a way that has associated Forno di Zoldo forever in my mind with that Arab proverb which describes Malaga as a city where fleas are always dancing to the tunes played by the mosquitoes. 
End of section 31. Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys, Section 32. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys, A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites, by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 13. Forno di Zoldi and Zoppe, Part 2. The mules are brought round early next morning, for we have a long day before us. Zoppe, distant rather more than three hours from Forni di Zoldo, has to be visited in the morning, and at two p.m. on our way back we have promised, in compliance with Signora Pezzi's particular request, to call upon her married daughter who lives at Piev di Zoldo, about a quarter of an hour above Forno. While we are at breakfast, it being a little after five a.m., the church bells ring out a merry peal. Concluding that it is either a saint's day or a wedding, I inquire what the joyful occasion may be, and learn, not without surprise, that an old and highly respected inhabitant has just given up the ghost. The Val di Zoppe, sometimes called the Val di Rutorto, branches away from the Val di Zoldo at an acute angle from a point a little way below Forno, and runs off northward towards the Pelmo. Our way thither lies at first through a chain of villages, Campo, Piev, Doza, Pra, and Bragareza. Passing Piev, we are met by Cesare Pesi, who is to take us to the studio of a certain self-taught wood sculptor named Valentino Gamba. He lives at Bragareza, a miserable, tumble-down hamlet on a steep hillside a mile or two farther on, where we first catch sight of him sitting in a desponding attitude on the doorstep of a small cottage. Being addressed by young Pese and invited to show his studio, he jumps up in red confusion and leads the way into a little back room, where stands an enormous oval frame of carved pine wood, destined for the Vienna exhibition of the present year, 1873. It is an unwieldy, overdone thing, loaded with arabesques, fruits, flowers, musical instruments, cupids, and the like, too big, too heavy, fit neither for a mirror nor a picture, but quite wonderful as an effort of untaught genius. An ideal bust of Italia, all stow in wood, is full of sweet and subtle expression, and pleases me better than the frame. What possesses me that I should inquire the price of that bust? It is life-size, and weighs, heaven only knows how much it weighs, but certainly as much as all our scanty baggage put together. I have no sooner asked the unlucky question than, seeing the flash of hope in the poor fellow's face, I reproach myself for having done so. He only asks two hundred lira for it, less than eight pounds, but I could no more be burdened with it on such a journey than with the church steeple. So I ask for his card, and promising to bid my English friends look out for his frame next summer in Vienna, take my leave with the awkward consciousness of having said more than I intended. From Bragareza the way lies between forest-clad hills up a constantly rising valley. The farther we go, the steeper and rougher the path becomes. The more desolate the valley, the more noisy the torrent. Then at last we have to dismount and let the mules scramble on alone. Now the Pelmo, as yesterday, comes suddenly into sight, its huge, tawny, snow-ridged battlements rising, close behind a near hillside, so close that it seems towering above our heads. And presently, for we are only just in time to see it clearly for a few minutes, a great white cloud sails slowly up from somewhere behind, wrapping the mountain round as with a mantle, so that we only catch flitting, fragmentary glimpses of it now and then through openings in the mist. Finally, Zope, a tiny brown village and white church perched high on a green mountainside, looks down upon us from the top of a steep path full four hundred feet above the valley. That little white church contains the Titian, which is the glory of all this countryside. A long pull up the hill and broiling sunshine brings us at last to the houses and the church. The door stands open, and, followed by all the men out of a neighboring wood-yard, we pass into the cool shade within. There, over the high altar, hangs the Titian, uncurtained, dusty, 
dulled by the taper smoke of centuries of masses. It is a small picture measuring about four feet by three, and represents the Virgin and Child enthroned. Supported by San Marco and San Girolamo, with Santa Anna sitting on the steps of the throne. It is, on the whole, a perplexing picture. The Madonna and Child, painted in the dry, hard style of the early German school, look as if they could not possibly have come from Titian's brush. The San Girolamo and Santa Anna scarcely rise above mediocrity, but the head and hands of San Marco are really fine, and go far to redeem the rest of the picture. The color, too, is rich and solid throughout. This altarpiece, painted, it is said, by order of one of the Palatini in 1526, is classed by Mr. Gilbert among the very few indubitable Titians yet preserved among the painter's native mountains. But notwithstanding its reputation, I find it difficult to believe that the great master painted much more than the head and hands of San Marco. The Perocco, hearing that there were strangers in the church, came presently to do the honors of his Titian. He was a fat, rosy, pleasant little priest, redolent of garlic, and attired in light blue shorts, a light blue waistcoat, grey worsted stockings, and a long black clerical coat, worn bottle green with age. He chattered away quite volubly, telling how Titian had once upon a time come up to Zoppe for villeggiatura in time of plague, and how he had then and there painted the picture by order of the aforesaid noble, who desired to place it in the church as a thank-offering. Also how it had hung there, venerated and undisturbed for centuries, till the French came this way in the time of the first Napoleon, and threatened to rob the commune of their treasure. Whereupon the men of Zope made a wooden cylinder, and rolled the picture on it, and buried it in a box at the foot of a certain tree up in the forest. And look, said the Perocco, you may see the marks of the cylinder upon the canvas to this day, and we have the cylinder still, signora, we have the cylinder still. I said something, I no longer remember what, to the effect that a genuine Titian was worth taking care of, and that the commune could not value it too highly. Value it, he repeated, bristling up rather unnecessarily. Value it, signora, of course we value it. Many governments have offered to buy it. We could sell it for three thousand gold ducats to-morrow, if we chose. Ebene, we are only six hundred souls up here in the piazza. Our men are poor, all poor, contadini in summer, legnatori in winter, but no price will purchase our titian. We afterwards learned that this public-spirited little parocco had been a mighty chamois hunter in his youth, and one of the first to scale the fastnesses of the Pelmo. Now we leave Zope on its hillside and come down again into the valley, catching by the way some wonderful glimpses of strange peaks, peeping out through mist and cloud in the direction of Monte Sviorina and the Primagiore range. And now, after a brief halt in the shade of a clump of trees beside a spring, we go on again, descending all the way, till we find ourselves back at Piev di Zoldo, and alighting at the gate of a large white house, where we are welcomed by young Pezzi's sister, Signora Pellegrini. Now Signora Pellegrini has married a man both wealthy and well-descended, and lives in a large, plentiful, patriarchal way, much as our English gentry lived in the time of the Tudors. She carries her keys at her girdle, and herself superintends her dairy, her cows, her pigs, her poultry, and her kitchen. Being ushered up a spacious staircase, and across a landing hung with family portraits of Pellegrinis, who were once upon a time bishops, priors, captains, and powdered seniors in ruffles and laced coats, we are shown into a reception room where a table is laid for luncheon. The master of the house is unavoidably absent, being gone to a cattle fair at Longarone, but Cesare Pesce takes his place at table, where everything is fresh, abundant, home-made, and delicious. After luncheon we go to see the church, a large structure with a fine Gothic nave, containing two or three curious early Italian pictures, and an important carved altarpiece by Andrea Brustolon, the Grinling Gibbons of South Tyrol, born in this valley of Zoldo in the year 1662. It is a quaint, strange subject, admirably executed, but not pleasant to look upon. They call it the Altari degli Animi, or Altar of the Two Souls. 
two figures intended to represent human suffering and human sorrow, each attended by a warning skeleton, support the entablature on each side. Two angels and a pieta crown it on the top. The execution is excellent, but the impression produced by the work is indefinitely painful. That evening we wander about the fields and lanes beyond the village, and the writer sketches some wild peaks, called by some the Monte Serrata, and by others the Monte Rochetta, which are seen from every point of view about the place. There is, of course, the customary difficulty of keeping intruders at bay. One old woman in wooden cloths, having looked on for a long time from her cottage door, comes hobbling out, and surveys the sketch with a ludicrous expression of bewilderment. "'Why do you do that?' she asks, pointing with one skinny finger and peering up sidewise into my face like a raven. I answer that it is in order to remember the mountain when I shall be far away. "'And will that make you remember it?' she says, incredulously. To this I reply that it will not only answer that purpose, but even serve to make it known to many of my friends who have never been here. This, however, is evidently more than she can believe." "'And where do you come from?' she asks next, after a long pause. "'From a country you have no doubt heard of many a time,' I reply. "'From England.' "'From England? Jesu Maria, from England. And where is England? Is it near Milan?' Being told that it is much more distant than Milan, and in quite the opposite direction, she is so confounded that she can only shake her head in silence and hobble back again. When she is halfway across the road, however, she stops short, pauses a moment to consider, and then comes back, armed with one last question. Echo, she says, tell me this, tell me the truth. Why do you come here at all? Why do you travel? To this I reply, of course, that we travel to see the country. To see the country, she repeats, clasping her withered hands. Grandio, have you then no mountains and no trees in England? End of section 32